this morning I talked to and I preached a message that God had laid on my heart entitled, Yes, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I mean, with an exclamation point. I told Angie to make sure you get one out there. And I, I wanted a picture when I was talking to her of somebody who was thinking. And you'll notice a lot of times when I'm thinking, and Angie always tells me, stop chewing on your fingers. Or, and I'm not really chewing on my fingers. I just push my finger in my mouth. She goes, it's not healthy. I know, but that's my thinking place. And I, I think I'm like that statue, you know, that's sitting there and puts his hand here like this. And, you know, I just, I just do this all the time. And, and I could be daydreaming and thinking. And, and I said, I want a picture of somebody who's, who's thinking and, and, and doing that. And then I want a little bubble thing. And so she looked up the picture and got it all worked out. And I said, well, make sure you put that explanation point. Yes. Like that. We can do that. And this morning we talked about it as a church. There's so much that we dream about. So much that we talk about. So much that we see. And, and for those who want to hear this morning, I want to make one important statement, which is, I believe is going to be a part of helping to propel us in the direction that God is calling us to go. And this is that. Instead of looking at what we're not doing as a church, let's dream about what we can do. I love that. I've been saying that to people on a regular basis in the last little while. Because, see, I believe that, as I said this morning, if we're not doing something, it means we can do it. We can do it. And I would venture to say that for every one of us in this place, a lot of times we get so occupied with life that the things that God is asking us to do a lot of times get neglected. I've been making a list, been listening to a lot of guys on time management in the last little while. Craig Rochelle did an amazing uh, podcast, two podcasts on, on time management. And then I listened to another one by Andy Stanley. And then I listened to another one in a book that was by John Maxwell. And in the run of one week, I heard this same statement three times. Leading well in time management is not about making a list of what to do. Most times, it's about making a list of what you got to stop doing. Wow. And I think for a lot of us here, because as I said this morning, there are so many people that, that have a heart that you just want to be involved. You see something needs to be done, you're just going to do it. Angie's like that. For instance, you'll, you'll notice that she could be just going from here, then she's gone to here, and then she's doing something over here, and, and, and able to go in so many different parts of what is happening in the church. And there's a lot of other people like that, and just got this goal to just, if something needs to be done, then I'm just going to go do it. And a lot of times... I believe in the church that unless some people step away from some things that they're probably just doing because it needs to be done, that somebody else is not going to rise up to do it because it's being done. I, I like Nico. Uh, uh, we, were, we were talking today about some of the things. And like a lot of times we come in in the morning and we set up stuff and, and do, do so much stuff. And we're saying, let's just let this stuff be set up. And not only that, let's have a Sunday. You know how cool it would be to have a Sunday someday when all the people that volunteer and some things just come and sit in the seats and not volunteer? Yeah. Volunteer, stay home Sunday. Watch online. <laughs> and watch and see how much stuff they wouldn't be able to watch on. They wouldn't be able to watch online. <laughs> That's right. But you watch and you see those things. It's, it's amazing what gets done in this place. And a lot of people don't know it because so much of it is being done by a lot of the same people. But God has got a role and a place for you. And you'll notice in churches, I was, I was reading through today about some of the things I dream of a church, of the points that people would put into place. And it was interesting to note how many people talked about so much different stuff about what they dreamt about a church being. Not everybody had the same dream. Not everybody had the same idea or same vision. But all the things that were said were all things that mattered. And that's what brings me to the next part of my message, which I, I want to go with here tonight. And that is what Rick uh, Warren likes to call the five different types of churches. And I want to talk about these very very briefly tonight, I don't have time to go and, and really dissect all these things like I would like to, but I want to start off in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 2 and verse 3, and I got these, I believe, in the Amplified. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 
verse 2 and verse 3, and then we're going to move on to Acts chapter 2 for a few verses of Scripture as well. So if you've got your Bibles, just turn there with me. So the first one I'm going to read is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2, and this is what it says. We are ever giving thanks to God for all of you, continually mentioning you when engaged in our prayers, recalling unceasingly before our God and Father your work. Everybody say work. Do you know nothing gets done in this earth without work? I mean, no, God worked for six days. On the seventh day, he rested. But those six days of work, he created the heavens and the earth. He created the animals. He created man. He created us. And there is a work, I believe, for the church, the work of the ministry that is vital. And this is an example of a church. And he, said, he, he goes on to say about how they were an example to others. But this first verse is where I want to go, or the second verse. Recalling unceasingly before God your Father the work energized by faith. Energized by faith. See, faith is the substance, Hebrews 11.1, 1, the evidence, the substance, what you hold on to of the things yet not seen. How many know there's some things we've yet to see? We, we, we talk about greater things. I don't know about you. I've seen some greater things, but after I've seen those greater things, I believe there's still greater things. Amen. And faith is a substance. It's, the Bible says in the Amplified Version, the title deed of the things that we're hoping for. And there's a lot of churches who can hope and hope and hope. And as I said this morning, this morning hope deferred <laughs> makes the heart sick. And a lot of times we hope for things, and when we don't see it in the natural, we become weary. Galatians 6 and 9, do not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, you will reap if you faint not. So I, I don't know about you, but I'm hoping for some things. But faith is a substance of what I'm hoping for. So we want our ministry here and the things we do in the church to be energized by faith and service. You know, we're here to serve our community. We're here to serve our neighbors. We're here to serve our brothers and our sisters. Somebody was telling me a story the other night about a prayer meeting that was taking place, and it was all men that were meeting. I think it was in Deer Lake. And in this prayer meeting where they were meeting, this guy came in, and, and, and he was just struggling with some things. And, and just out of the blue, somebody knew that there was something that just was written on his face. You could see a weight. And this person just saw this, and he said, you know what, I got to... I got to talk to this guy. I knew there was something he never shared tonight and probably something he didn't want to share. He walked up to him and he asked him, he said, hey, how you doing? What's on your heart? And this guy just began to share everything that was on his heart. Begin to tell him about how right now just work has just not been where it needs to be. He's got rent to pay. He don't know how he's going to pay it, but he's trusting and he's believing God, and he just knows that he needs to, you know, needs to press in, and God is going to answer these needs. And this person that was talking to him was a part of the, of, of, of the church. I mean, no, God's got a big church all over this world. Amen? And it's amazing, as he was talking to him, he had some money that he had taken out that he forgot to give to somebody he had supposed to give it to earlier, and he had it in his pocket. And as he was talking to this guy, the Spirit of God led him, because the guy told him, he, he said how much he had to pay in his rent. And all of a sudden, this guy just realized that exact amount he said, it's not a coincidence, that exact amount is in my pocket. Hmm. So he took it out of his pocket, and he passed it to the man. He said, I feel I'm supposed to do this, and this is why it's still in my pocket. And he gave it to this gentleman, and this gentleman couldn't, he was just blown away. He thanked him. His rent was paid, and right after that, his commitment to God, his commitment to go, got a job, got all these things turned around, and before he knew it, he's plugged still into the church, growing. His, his family got the rent paid, bills paid, and got a great job that came right after that. I mean, that's the way the church is. That's the church in operation. Want me to show you a little bit about that? Next verse we're going to turn to uh, is in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to see some of that in operation in the New Testament. But let me finish this first before I get ahead of myself. Service. Jesus didn't come 
to be served, but he came to serve. Amen? And as he is in the world, so we are, so we are also, thank you, Stephanie, we are also, amen, service motivated by love. How many of love will motivate you to do stuff you shouldn't even do? Love for our children sometimes will motivate us to probably give some things that we were never supposed to give. Why do we think we see some kids end up spoiled? Because there's love. But then there's the proper kind of love. But service motivated by love. If there's love in the church, we will be motivated to serve our community and to serve our brothers and sisters. And he says, you're on a wavering hope in the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're on wavering hope in Jesus, the Messiah. Now, Acts chapter 2, if you got your Bibles, turn there with me tonight. And I'm sure they'll be able to put it up on the screen as well. Acts chapter 2. And we're going to move right on down to the last so many verses here. We'll begin to read in verse 41 is where we're going to begin to read. This is just after the day of Pentecost. When Jesus has come back, he sent the Holy Spirit. He had filled them to an overflowing. And Peter stands up and says, these people are not drunk, you suppose, but they're filled with the Holy Ghost. And this was what was spoken by the prophet Joel. The church begins. It was added to the church 3,000. And then here in verse 41, this is the birth, the start of the church. What did they do? And they that gladly received the word were baptized the same day there were added to, the, to them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the word, and in fellowship, and in breaking bread, and in prayer. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed, all that believed were together and had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men in every, that every man who had need. Every man that had need. What would happen in the church if we took these principles into practice? Amen? And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. Church, if the only time we fellowship with the church is in this building then we're missing some of the most beautiful times of fellowship. Some of the greatest times of fellowship when there's three or four people sitting across from each other having a cup of coffee and really doing life together. We're missing that. I talk to so many people in this church who say, you know what, I miss fellowship. One of the things that this church used to do was house meetings. I used to remember going in as a little boy when this church didn't have a building to meet in every week. And I remember going into these churches, into these houses, and I remember going in and trying to find a place to sit because so many people had filled a house. And I remember being in one meeting. It was at my house on Hillview Road. And I was just probably 13, 14 years old. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I heard this somewhat familiar voice. And I'm, I'm sitting on the, on, on the steps there, and I, I hear this loud voice. It sounded familiar, but I'm thinking, no, that can't be. Maybe it is, because I had heard it before, but I looked over, and this is my mom praying in the spirit, waking up the church. And I remember there was an interpretation came after that, and I remember sitting there in the house listening to that. It was powerful. And I believe kids used to go in the room. I remember I got videos that we played not too long ago. I used to go in the room and, and, and just spend some time there. And they would come out. And what would they experience? They would experience the presence of God. And the kids who walked into that, whether they were a part of it in the sense of filling the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, that wasn't the case. But they were experiencing something. And when our children come to a church, in, when there's the presence of God, they experience something. They experience something. These kids that are back here right now, that some of you are here, let me tell you something. They're experiencing something. They're experiencing something. And I'm glad that they are in the house of God. I would love to see the church filled with them. Amen? It's good stuff. Then he says, house to house. 
And they ate their meat with gladness and singleness of bread, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Why? Fellowship, the word, doctrine, evangelism, miracles. These are the things that we need to see in operation of the church. It's the balance of the church. And these are the principles that we find in the scripture. Five kinds of church. I'm going to go through this real quick. The soul winning church. The soul winning church. I mean, no, every church should be a soul winning church. And what I want to tell you is that this is not something that is unhealthy in the sense. It's just that some churches focus on one area but neglect the rest. And a healthy church is focus on all these things. And this is what I want us to see and where I would love to see our church as we continue to grow because I see us fitting in so many of these categories already. But the soul winning church, if the pastor or the people see their primary role as an evangelist, the church becomes a soul winning church. There's nothing wrong with that. But if the church is only focused on soul winning and people come to know Jesus and there's not focused on discipleship as well, what happens? People find Jesus and then they drift away because they never get established in the roots and the strong faith in doctrine. So we have to have the healthy balance. The things that you will hear in this church often are terms like this. Witnessing, evangelism, salvation, decisions for Christ, visitation, altar calls, crusades, Visitate or baptisms, all these things are good, but this is be the predominant thing. Then you have the experience God church. And this is where there's gifts in the leadership or in the pastors and in the worship teams where we experience worship and we lead the church into worship and into experiencing God. I mean, no, you want to experience God. Do you want to experience God? Taste and see that God is good. But I'm going to know sometimes the church, so often, they seek this experience with God, and that's what it all becomes about, the experience, an experience. I want an experience. I want more. I can't feel goosebumps. Where's my goosebumps? I need some goosebumps. I love the goosebumps. Don't you love it? Don't you love it when God blows through a room, and you just know he just showed up? Whoo! I love experiencing God. I want to be a church that's a soul-winning church, but I also want to be a church that experiences God. But a lot of times in these churches, the focus is on just sensing his presence and power of God in worship. The thing about this is what happens in a church if they go through a dry spell? People become frustrated because they're not rooted in the word. Amen? So healthy. I don't want to just be a church who experiences God. I want to be a church who experiences God in all areas and that we're a healthy church. I dream of a church that's healthy. What's the natural result of health? Angie and I, I told you before, we don't look after our plants. We like to see them. I love going to people's houses and seeing plants that look great. But we got one plant that sits next to our sink where there's lots of water. It's not a hard job to water that plant. But he's almost dead. Plants don't, if you give us plants, it's probably going to die. The poor thing. Why? Because we're not giving it the health it needs. We usually have goldfish, fish that die. We we had Devin living with us for around three years, and one Christmas he wanted goldfish, and when he left, he couldn't take him with us. Our biggest fear was when he left is, oh my goodness, I mean, one of the things is, those fish are going to die. Because we don't know how to look after fish very good. But man, those, I don't know what, they're blessed fish. Because they are growing and they're getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> I'm serious, and, and I don't feed them at all. And, uh, but An- Angie does. Thank God somebody's looking after them. But if, what's the natural result of healthy? Healthy heating, what's the natural result? A healthy body. What's the natural result of someone who's healthy? In the sense, one of the things we talked about in one of our board meetings the other day is, you know what? One of the things that we don't focus on sometimes as a church is health. And there's a lot of stuff in Scripture about health. And there's a lot of people got good teaching on health. And that's some of the things that we want to probably bring into the teaching of some of the things we teach in the church. But like I said, if a plant is being watered, it's going to be healthy. So the result of a healthy church is it grows. And like I said this morning, listen, God's plan is for the church to grow. God's plan is for the church to grow. The things that you'll hear in this type of church, the experience God church is praise 
prayer, worship, music, spiritual gifts, spirit power, revival. All those things are good. And we want to see that. But I mean, oh, there's more. There's more. Then we have the Family Reunion Church. And this is the church that its primary focus is fellowship. The church is shaped by relational people, people who love people, people who spend most of their time caring for people and caring for their members. The key terms in this church is love, belonging, fellowship, caring, pop blesses, small groups, and fun. Sounds like a good church, doesn't it? I want to be a church that fellowships. But I mean, no, there's more than just fellowshipping. There's more to it. Um, if we're a church that just focuses on, is on fellowship, a lot of people are going to want to come and have fun, and they're going to be there for the social part of things. You know one of the things about a church that's really strong in fellowship among young people and among youth is this. What you'll notice is young people leave their youth groups where they've had a social club, where they've met and they fellowship and they had lots of games and they had lots of fun and they had lots of time, but then when they go away to university, 80% of them fall away from God because they got away from their social gathering. But they never had a love, a passionate love for the Word of God. So it's having a healthy balance. I want a church that is balanced in these areas. Do you know a church who focuses mostly on fellowship in those areas, and not just that church, but most churches, if the pastor or leaders do, do all the work when it comes to the visiting, all the work when it comes to the mentoring, all the work when it comes to counseling, all the work when it comes to these things, they cannot grow beyond 150 people or so. And the reason being is that most pastors burn themselves out so often trying to care for the people. But I mean, no, we are called to care for one another. We're called to care for one another. Well, a pastor never called me. Well, the church, I had one person who went away to school one time. They came back to visit me, and they said that, uh, that I hadn't visited them. It was a girl, and I hadn't called. I hadn't messaged on Facebook. And the thing is, most times I don't do that. But, you know, I had been in communication. And I knew the people who had messaged. I knew the people I had asked to message, and so much of this stuff happened. And what happened was I never, but people in the church were. They felt that we never weren't a church of love when people in the church were loving her. See, sometimes you might not get a call from a pastor, but if it's a part of this church calling you, it's the body. It's the body calling you. And when one mourns, we all mourn. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. I think we need to pick up our phone on a regular basis in the run of a week and fellowship with one another. I think we need to text encouraging words to one another. I think we need to text some emoticons, some emoticons and some happy faces and some of these things to say, hey, I'm thinking about you. What would happen if we did that? What would happen if you wrote a letter? And you just dropped it into the mailbox of someone. And you just begin to share some of the things that you have saw about their life that encouraged you. What would happen if we all as a church begin to do things like that? What encouragement that would be. Amen? Then there's the classroom church. And this church is the kind of church that focuses mostly just on teaching. And they have gifted teachers. And it's wonderful. And the emphasis on preaching and the emphasis is, is not so much on the task of the church, but just on the word and great teaching. This church may even have a, something about the Bible in their name. In these words, the key words you'll use is this, Bible study, Greek, Hebrew, doctrine, knowledge, truth, discipleship. How many know we should be a classroom church? Amen? I, don't be, I want a word. I want to learn. Some people, and, and let, me, let me correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you'll, you'll agree with me. I can turn on some teaching. I love Keith Moore. Keith Moore is a solid, solid teacher. He quotes scripture after scripture, reads scripture after scripture. Scripture. I open my Bible and try to follow along with him, trying to keep up with the scriptures he's listening to. My like, goodness, he just, he's a solid teacher. But I know some people who don't like to listen to Keith Moore. Because they want T.D. Jakes. Glory to God. Yes, i got to tell you something. Because they love preaching. Amen? I, was my, I, I might get a better T.D. Jakes experience when I get back from, from, uh, from our, our vacation and 
that conference. But, but some people love preaching. Why? Because it's, it's exciting. But I'm going to know when you go to a university, let's ask Stephanie, when to university, did you find everything exciting? You're like, how much more do I have to learn? Uh, Dr. Vermouten, did you enjoy all those years to be where you I mean, the stu- and the studying that still goes on to keep up to date. No, but what does the scripture tell us? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen? So, yes, we want to be a classroom. Sometimes you're going to sit in here, you're going to listen to me teach something and probably not preach and probably not stand in the chairs and probably not do my preacher kick. But the bottom line is this. If you listen, if you get a hold of the word, it'll change your life. I want to be a healthy church. I don't want to be a church who has these things functioning. The next thing, and the fifth one, is a social conscious church. And this is a church that's out to change society. Can you see us there a little bit there? This is a church that it's full of activists, activists, people who are doers of the word, not just hearers only. We got to do something, pastor. We got to go, pastor. We got to talk to people, pastor. We need to go, and there's, there's something going on in our community, and we need to make a big difference. And, and this is the doers, the social conscious church. It comes in a liberal and a conservative version. The liberal version tends to focus on the injustice of society. The conservative version tends to focus on the moral decline of society. The injustice of society and the moral decline of society. Liberal and conservative, the moral decline. Sin is run rapid. Yes, but where sin abounds, Grace abounds much more. Amen? We need to be a church that's socially conscious. We need to understand that this world needs a church that's willing to focus on the social issues of our communities in a way that we say, listen, I'm tired. I I, I literally, I I got a a Facebook message come through my Facebook about a month ago of, of a young lady saying, I'm struggling with prostitution. Please pray for me. It's in our community. I've sat across the table. And most of you probably wouldn't even know this. In our soup kitchen with men and also with a girl who's living that life. It's an issue that we deal with in Cornerbrook. Sometimes we're blind to the social issues, but I'm going to know the church is not supposed to be blinded inside the four walls to the social issues that our community is facing. The church is called to get outside the walls and make a difference in this world. Amen? The things that you'll hear in this church is needs, serve, share, minister, take a stand, do something. Can you see a little bit of me in that? We've got to take a stand and be who God's called us to be. If I had a nickel for every time I said that, And you know what? I'd be a rich man, and I am rich. (laughs) Praise God. We see all these churches. I believe I could see a mixture of some of our body and our church in these churches. But I believe in the coming days that we're going to be a church who's going to be not just a church the plant looks great, but we're going to give it some water. <laughs> I don't want to let this plant die while the fish are living. Amen. We've got to look after all aspects of our home. It's like Angie getting the, getting the plant to come alive and feeding the fish, but not feeding her husband. I mean, we can't do that. Now, she wouldn't do that. Amen. We need to be a healthy church. We need to have all these things working. But to do that, I believe we need to have an intentional, an intentional plan that we have work that's energized by faith, that we have service that's motivated by love, that we have unwavering hope in Jesus, and that we are a church who takes advantage of all these situations. If we don't plan, church, we plan to fail. Now, our plan might not be perfect. Now, we know it's up to the Holy Spirit direction. And I believe that no church, I believe the essential, essential prerequisite Is that the right word? Prerequisite? For church, growth is prayer. I believe if our plan is not first preceded by prayer, then it's our plan and not his plan. But a church who plans, 
a church who prays, a church who decides, hey, we're going to intentionally be healthy. We're going to intentionally be the church that God has called us to be. We're going to intentionally have a mixture of all these areas that we are going to do as Acts chapter 2. The things that you'll find there are evangelism, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and worship. We want to have all of those areas functioning in our church. That's my church that I dream of, and I believe I'm a part of it. We're a church that worships. I believe we're a church that reach. I believe we're a church that connects. I believe we're a church that is growing. And I believe that we can make a difference in this world we live in. When I think about what God wants to do in this community, I see it so big. And I'm going to close my book so I won't keep you here too long tonight. When I think about what God wants to do in this community, I remember watching a video in the Rexplex just the other day, my father prophetically speaking over my life, and he said, don't dare become like the shark in the aquarium who only grows six inches or so because of its surroundings. I said to dad the other day, do you see this church growing to see 500 people, to see 1,000 people? There's a city that if every church in this city was filled to capacity, filled to overflowing, the vast majority of Cornerbrook would be still outside the doors. See, it's not a pastor who's going to reach the community. It's the body that is allowing Jesus to work through them that's going to reach this community. I want you to ask yourself the question, when was the last time you led someone through the sinner's prayer to accept Jesus? When was the last time you went out to find someone to serve? When was the last time we went out to reach into our community? When was the last time we turned on worship music in our house and said, God, direct me and lead me? I just want to serve you. I want to know your heart for my life. A lot of times so much when we get caught up, but I know I'm there too. Sometimes I get on my face before God and tears drip from my cheeks. And sometimes it's not about the mess of my community and the people that don't know Jesus. Sometimes it's about what I need in my life right now. I don't want to ever get stuck with what I need and be stuck there and I mean, oh, God cares about that. But let me tell you, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of these things will be added unto you. Why don't you take a minute? I want you to bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this body of people. God, I thank you for people that you've called not just to fill a seat, but you've called to energize them by faith, to have work that's motivated by love and the hope of Christ in them, the revelation and the revealing and the realizing of his glory. Father, I thank you for people that have gifts that I believe are awakening. God, I thank you for people that God fit into some of these categories we just read about tonight. The church is made up of so many different people with so many different ideas of what the church is supposed to be and what sunrise is supposed to be and what we are supposed to do. And God, you have brought different people from different walks of life so that every part of this church can be filled with people with talents and gifts that are different from one another. So, God, I thank you for those that you're raising up to fill places that need to be filled. God, I thank you for people who are making lists of things that they are to stop doing so they can make room for somebody else to start doing. God, I thank you, Lord, that the mission of this church, the mission statement, that, God, you have called us to raise up an army of believers that know how to use God's word and prayer to win souls, heal the sick, and change circumstances, to teach and preach God's word accurately and effectively, to provide an atmosphere of praise and worship in which God can move freely by his spirit, and to help the poor as God enables and directs. God, there is a mission that you've given this church. And God, I pray the more that we get a hold of that, (laughs) and we find our part in that 
believe the more that we will see this community flooding the doors of this church. I believe for that, Father. Mm. I say some people can get so busy in their church that they never have time to reach people in their community. Hmm. Let me say that again. Sometimes people can get so busy in their church that they don't have time to reach people in their community. For some of you, it's making a list. See, I think everybody in this church outside of a Sunday should be involved in something that happens throughout the week. I believe it's vital. I believe it's important. But have a balance. Know where you fit. And as pastors and leaders, we want to help you find that. If there's something on your heart that God is speaking to you about, maybe for some of you, you want to work with some people that, for instance, messages like I told you I got, maybe you want to be someone who can reach out to this person. To start a ministry to those who feel like they have no other choice but to sell their body to pay bills or provide for an addiction. Maybe some of you here are feeling something else in your heart that you're supposed to be a part of. Listen, don't neglect that. If your heart is beating for something, to be a part of something in this church, come and talk with us. Come and see us. Help us to direct you and lead you and empower you in those things. I believe that the more that we as a body stand up together, <laughs> the more effective we can be because we all are different parts of this body. Now we're going to worship. And as we do, I want you to pray. I want you to pray this. Father, show me what you want from me. Don't let it be, God, I need this, or God, I, let it be, God, show me what you want from me. What's the next step you have for me? God, show me where I'm going from here. Show me how, God, I'm called to fit into this place. And let me be bold enough to be able to speak about that. Yes, we love.